Okay, so now we, we get to the next and last uh, part of the program today. Uh, my name is Thomas Blom Hansen from the University of Amsterdam. I'm a visiting uh, uh, scholar at the Southern Asian Institute uh, this academic year. And I, um, I enjoy myself uh, greatly. It feels almost like being in heaven. Um, and uh, I don't know much about heaven, but uh, uh, I imagine it would be something like it. And it may be the, uh, and, and the, 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 the nature of the uh, so-called duties that are uh, given to me by Janaki and, and William uh, are, for instance, uh, such as introducing Kian Pandey. As you will know, that is not, uh, you, you will imagine, and you will hear very soon, it's not a very onerous task. The only onerous thing about it is the length and complexity of the CV. So, uh, Gian Pande uh, is, uh, is a, a very well-known uh, scholar, well-known to many of you, I believe. Um, he is, uh, 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 at the moment, uh, from since 2006, uh, he has been the uh, Arts and Sciences Distinguished Professor at Emory University in Atlanta. Before that, he was uh, at uh, uh, Johns Hopkins for a number of years, seven I think, and a number of years at, at, at Delhi uh, University as well, teaching history in all those places. Gian uh, received his doctorate from the University of Oxford in 1975, and then from his CV I could see there was a lot of uh, different uh, short-term appointments, and uh, has, uh, Gian was teaching in many different places, such as Leeds, Hyderabad, he spent time in Calcutta in the early 80s, and was at that point uh, also part of the uh, founding collective, or became part of the founding collective of the Subaltern Studies uh, group, uh, or Subaltern Studies, and um, uh, edited a number of the volumes uh, that came out of that project. Um, uh, he uh, has also been a visiting professor in a large number of universities, both in the US, Michigan, Chicago, and many other places, and also a number of places in Europe, uh, Edinburgh, Amsterdam, uh, Heidelberg and so on, some of the places uh, where we have actually met because I happened to work there at the time when Gian came. Uh, and that's always been a great fun and a great pleasure. Uh, Gian has had uh, a number of, uh, has done many different things in his uh, long career. Um, he has uh, started out with a, an interest which uh, is what uh, really uh, became uh, or made his name and made him into, I think, it's fair to say, the most important uh, Indian historian of uh, communalism uh, in, in not just in North India, but in India as such. And that begins with a book in 1978 about the ascendancy of the Congress, which is, I believe, your dissertation. And then uh, comes in 1990, the colonial construction of communalism, which perhaps is still the most well-known uh, of uh, your many books. Um, and then uh, an edited volume that came out in 93 called Hindus and Others plus countless articles. Um, these are all, this is seminal and important work and I think that there are two essays I want to mention that if you haven't read them, but uh, you should immediately. Uh, they have appeared on hundreds of syllabi across the world. Uh, these are smaller essays but I think shows again at his very best. Uh, one uh, of the most famous one is uh, 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 one is called In Defense of the Fragment from 1991 and uh, another one came in 1909 which is called Can a Muslim Be an Indian? Um, uh, later on, again moves on to do a study of, uh, based on oral history on, on partition and uh, two books came out of that uh, Memory, History and Questions of Violence in 1999 uh, and Remembering Partition from Cambridge University Press in 2002 and then Gien also becomes one of the select few people who has a omnibus from OUP Delhi. There are not many of you, um, uh, but uh, uh, that came, I think, in 2004, didn't it? Five? No, uh, last year. Last year, okay. Now, that would be enough for most people uh, to do all this, but uh, uh, Gien began, uh, when he was in Baltimore, uh, a, a serious interest in, in uh, African-American uh, communities, uh, in that city way before The Wire made it uh, uh, um, very uh, fashionable to think about Baltimore, and, uh, 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 and began to pursue a comparison uh, 
between uh, uh, African-American identities and Dalit identities in India, which is the direct reason why he is, uh, will be speaking to us today. So there is uh, a number of uh, things coming out of that. His project is called Genealogy, uh, Genealogy of Prejudice, African-American and Dalit Middle Classes. And some of you may have seen uh, an article that appeared in public culture uh, uh, in the last issue, I believe, which is called Can There Be a Dalit Middle Class? Uh, and I, I suppose that, again, we'll be uh, speaking to some of those issues today. There's also a book that is just off uh, the printer, uh, which is called, it's an edited volume, which is called Subaltern Citizens and Their Histories, which, is, which mixes uh, 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 articles on African Americans and uh, Dalits uh, in a very productive way. I've just had a chance to uh, uh, look through it. So, uh, I think with, with all that, we uh, have a lot to look forward to, and uh, I think we, sh we should uh, uh, welcome uh, Gian Pande and give him a hand, please. Um, thank you very much, Thomas, and thank you to Janaki and the other organizers of this uh, wonderful occasion, this uh, very special event for inviting me here and giving me a chance to uh, try out some of my thoughts and uh, present some ideas and some work uh, in progress to you for feedback. Um, I have to say to Thomas that the downside of heaven is that <laughs> Eastern UP laborers get there. Uh, laborers from Eastern UP now masquerading as academics <laughs> invited to this particular conference and invited to places where you yourself have uh, invited me. Uh, but thank you all very much uh, for uh, including me in this particular conversation. Um, I also want to thank um, um, Columbia's very long tradition of scholarship and what it has given to me, and you'll see much of it uh, represented in what I have to say today, um, from <coughs> scholars who are here at the moment and whose work I draw upon, obviously, um, like uh, Nick Dirks and Gauri Vishwanathan um, and my old colleagues Partha Chatterjee and Shudip Kaviraj and others, uh, but also scholars who passed through or who were here for a long uh, length of time or short, short period of time, um, starting with Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, but coming down to much younger scholars who have been here uh, recently for some length of time. Uh, Amir Mufti, for example, whose work again I draw upon and Robin Kelly on the African-American side, whose work too I draw upon. So um, the talk I'm going to give uh, is entitled The Politics of Difference, uh, and it's a reflection on the Dalit struggle. Uh, it could be called subalternity and difference because of the track from which I come, but it is about difference much more pointedly. And I invoke in the course of what I have to say today, I shall invoke uh, the uh, African-American experience and the women's experience, women's case and the black uh, studies case, uh, repeatedly. Uh, that invocation is very important to the argument I want to make. I'm not able to detail it uh, very much today. I, I'll focus on the Dalit case uh, for reasons of this particular conference and for reasons of time. But I do want to say that the other cases are important to the argument I, I'm trying to make. So, with that as background, uh, in this recently published anthology, Subaltern Citizens and Their Histories, Investigations from India and the USA, my colleagues and I have attempted to reaffirm and radicalize the notion of subalternity by underlining its inescapably political character, that is, subalternity is always negotiated, contested, marginality by stressing again that it is not organized along a single grid, such as that of the economy. East UP laborers. <laughs> and by insisting on the relevance of the concept to advanced liberal democracies and bourgeois societies in our day, no less than to the so-called developing and underdeveloped countries of the third world, or pre-industrial and pre-modern times. So that's why the conversation between scholars of the US and scholars of India is of importance to us. Uh, Katrina and the way in which Bush gets elected is of importance to us uh, as much as what happens in 
Mayavati's UP, for example. Okay? What I want to do today is to re-examine the idea of difference in order to extend and deepen our investigations of subalternity and to return more sharply to the question that feminist and other oppositional movements have raised of how modern societies and states can take account of and live with difference. In undertaking this task, it will help to prize away the notion of difference from the rather impoverished sense of diversity, of segments or minorities revolving around a center, usually the nation state. A move that assumes that the structure of society, the social organization, and the range of political possibilities is always given from the start. We already know the structure, we know its center, and it's a question of arranging pieces and elements around it in some way. I want to trouble this assumption in two ways. The first, which I hope will be readily conceded, is to recognize that difference is by definition manifold and fluid. Like subalternity, only perhaps more obviously so, the idea of difference cannot be thought or organized along a single, say cultural or biological grid. Distributed along multiple axes, it comes in innumerable forms, appearing differently in different places malleable, evolving elements and tendencies that come into view and disappear, change, coalesce, and reappear in other forms and other networks in other contexts. Thus, the idea of difference signals fundamentally and importantly a history and politics of becoming of something that is always coming into being, not of the already normalized, stable, and relatively immutable. Secondly, I will relate the issue of difference or minority to which it is commonly reduced. That is the pronouncement of radical alterity allegedly based on natural biological dissimilarity or long established and deeply rooted conditions of apartness as in man versus woman, uh, man versus woman, black versus white, African or oriental against uh, European, Hindu versus Muslim, Christian as against Jew, lesbians, gays, bisexuals, transsexuals against heterosexuals. Um, that pronouncement of radical alterity, I want to um, um, relate that to the issue of subalternity, that is, articulations of dominance and subordination, and the hierarchical ordering of social, political, and economic power. Historians and other social scientists have in recent years generated significant research and debate around the ideas of subalternity and of difference. In the main, however, I suggest, work around these concepts has led to two different, one might even say autonomous, narratives. One concerned ostensibly and primarily with subalternity, the other with difference. The most unex unexpected example of this split, uh, and this is where I need help from Robin Kelly and others, but uh, my uh, African-Americanist colleagues and Americanist colleagues um, are discussing this with me. To me, this is, a, this is still a hunch, but it's something that I, I believe uh, is true in, in many ways. The most unex uh, unexpected example of this split may be the discourse on African Americans in the USA, where the history of one and the same individual bo body, the single individual body, and a social assem assemblage identified as black, repeatedly tends to get channelized into two distinct streams. The first, dealing with the African American freedom struggle, which is framed in terms of minority history, assimilation or separation, De uh, uh, emancipation, desegregation, and the struggle for civil rights, and the second with material deprivation, poverty, labor, social mobility, and middle classness. Now, I, I, I should clarify that a little bit. I'm not suggesting that historians have not written about these two things together, about class and race together in the African American context. Uh, on the contrary, I mean, uh, Robin is only one example, Barbara Fields, and my colleagues, Earl Lewis, and uh, Leslie Harris, and numerous others have struggled to produce this history of African-American existence and experience as a history in which race and class both work together in peculiar ways. The difficulty is that all too often one of these, say race, gets reduced to the other class or vice versa. And the history of the making of subalternity and of difference disappears. And Robin Kelly actually puts that point well in making the point that history from below has had little uh, impact on the study of African Americans. Uh, there are those who might argue, he says, that all black history is from below. Uh, 
so to speak, since African Americans are primarily a working class population. This view has its problems, however. I'm still quoting. For many scholars concerned with studying race relations fold the black working class into a very limited and at times monolithic definition of the black community. So black working class equals black community. Or as Nell Painter, another colleague uh, uh, from Princeton um, puts it, uh, this work has converted the black working class into representative colored men and by that means dehistoricizing it. The question I want to ask is, what happens when we bring the discourses surrounding subalternity and difference together? How do these notions intersect with, enable, or complicate one another? What happens to the idea of difference or minority when it is not already visible as a historically or biologically or ideologically established truth, but has instead to be constituted as a political category by the subordinated, the marginalized, and the disenfranchised? Uh, in the broadest sense of those terms. What, in a word, are the politics of difference? So my next section is called The Jewish Question, and you'll see why. And you'll also see uh, that I've read Amir Mufti's recent book on emancipation in the colony very carefully, enlightenment in the colony. It will help to begin by setting the received idea of difference in a more precise historical context. In order to appreciate something of its force and implications in recent political and academic discourse, a prominent theme in the history of the world since the late 18th century has been the promise of political emancipation. The emancipation of societies and groups that are marked out as backward or disadvantaged or simply adrift from the mainstream, uh, the mainstream of human history and progress. Um, as it is conceived by the Enlightenment, after the Enlightenment. It goes without saying that this discourse of emancipation follows from the attribution and assertion of a certain privilege and centrality to those able to accumulate power during this period, and more generally, those able to set what is called normality. Right? Uh, those, therefore, who will set down the terms of history, civilization, normality, all of those things. The question of emancipation indeed becomes at once a question of emancipation assimilation and of tolerance, a byword of the Enlightenment. The tolerance by the majority, the mainstream, or more accurately, those able to lay down the norms of acceptable levels of difference, because that's the critical issue, acceptable levels of difference. There is another important dimension to this anticipated history of progress. For much of the 19th and 20th centuries, the question of political emancipation was seen centrally as a question of national emancipation. In that context, once the principle of nation states and national self-determination had come to be accepted, the question of emancipation, assimilation, and tolerance came to be focused on minorities, so-called. Throughout these centuries, the domain of the political was articulated in terms of the relationship between a state and its people nation worked out in significant measure through the ongoing and mutual determinations of nationality and minority. The paradigm case here is that of the Jews, who emerge as indeterminate, uncertain minorities, neither insiders nor outsiders, as different countries in Europe come to organize themselves into nation states in the 19th century. The supposedly enlightened, tolerant civil society of modern Europe, and with it, the idea of the abstract citizen subject in the rational universal order of the nation state is challenged by the very existence and individuality of the Jew, who is seen as being too particularistic and yet too global, too rooted and yet too dislocated at one and the same time. The problematic of difference takes the form of the Jewish question. And Marx's essay on that question becomes a lasting reminder of the impossibility of the political emancipation of the Jew as Jew, that is, of political emancipation in a liberal mode, tolerating difference but demanding uniformity. Uh, uh, many, many scholars have written on this theme. You will know much of that literature, and Amir's book is only one of the most recent, and I think a very insightful restatement of much of this, thing, and um, much of what I've said in the last couple of paragraphs and draws from his work. I, I want to underline the fact that the Jewish question is a metaphor for much more than the Jews. 
to put it to put it bluntly, the Muslims are the Jews of the later 20th century, <laughs> of the later 20th century and beyond. Um, and like the Jews, uh, they're too narrowly community-centered, and they're too worldwide. They're too deracinated, and they're too located at one and the same time. Right? So um, they're, they're, they're not easily unmarked, invisible citizens of the nation state. There's just too much going on there. Their particularity is, <coughs> uh, is a problem, basically. The authority of what I'm going to call this 19th century problematic has remained largely undiminished, even when nationalist discourse has lost some of its earlier self-confidence and visibility. Even when, one might argue, we can think of states, but no longer nations. Academics and other political commentators continue to present arguments in terms of centers and margins, nations and the minorities they must accommodate and national cultures that are about religious or ethnic coexistence and tolerance, and have little to do with labor and relationships to the land and its products, let alone the impact upon us of physical forces outside the social cultural world, changing conditions of the environment, and new possibilities of reproduction, cloning, and perpetuating or transforming the homo, uh, homo sapiens as a species being. The nationalist problematic of deviant cultural min uh, minority remains fundamental. And state-sponsored programs to promote multiculturalism, tolerance, and assimilation proliferate as proof of this. The next section um, I've called Blacks, Dalits, and Women. Because I want to shift the discussion of difference to another kind of other within, one that is signaled by my juxtaposition of the term subaltern indifference. I said to you that this talk could have been called subaltern indifference, and that's the juxtaposition uh, I've also tried to make. If the Muslims are the recognizable Jews of the later 20th century, the unrecognized other of the era from the late 18th century onwards have been slaves and untouchables, women and other subordinated groups, whose existence and particularity mount an equally important challenge to the existing discourses of civil society, uniform civil rights, and the abstract citizen subject of the new national and democratic order. What happens to our account of the politics of emancipation assimilation if the paradigmatic example of the history of difference and minority is taken to be not the Muslim or Jewish question, but the Dalit, black, or women's question? What, too, if the paradigm case of world historical development is taken to be not Europe, which has clearly assumed this place from the time of Hegel and Marx, uh, if not earlier, but North and South America or South Asia. In the 19th century, according to Marx, England, and then perhaps Germany, and then perhaps Russia, showed to the world the face of the future. In the 20th and 21st centuries, one might say, it is the USA and China and India, Bolivia and Ecuador, Better still, one might recognize that there is no one face to world history, but many masks donned in various ways at various times to produce the illusion of one world with its natural ordering of dominance and subordination, male and female, ethnicity versus ethnicity, and so on. The specific character, so if we take the paradigm case as black Dalit or women rather than the Muslim Jew, the specific character of the Dalit or black, and stretching the point only a little, also the women's case, is that it is seen as being marked above all by conditions of subordination and deprivation, as opposed to the Jewish Muslim case, which is reckoned primarily in terms of what would be described as cultural deviance. The latter is viewed from the start, the Jewish Muslim case, as a fully formed alternative culture and dangerous other whereas the precise status of women or slaves or untouchables as other or as a minority is itself in doubt. Several consequences follow, therefore, if we substitute the paradigm of the Dalit black woman for the Jew Muslim in our investigation of political emancipation and the making of modern societies and states. First, our attention should be immediately drawn to the making of difference or of a minority or minorities not already established in their difference from the start. Moreover, if we take the, seriously the position that the pro production of difference and hence minority is a process 
not a given demographic or sociological condition. We, uh, it becomes all the more necessary to attend to the kind of minoritization we encounter in the history of particular states and societies and to examine the implications of distinct forms of minority existence. Take, for instance, uh, the critical scholar's attention, and I'm taking this from Amir, uh, to, I'm quoting, those moments at which liberal culture attempts sincerely, he underlines sincerely, he emphasizes it, those moments at which liberal culture attempts sincerely, as it were, to resolve the question of the Jews, or in India, of Muslims. He is interested, Mufti writes, in how liberalism historically has talked about the modes of apartness of the Jews and the history of their persecution in Western society and the kinds of solution it has offered. And he takes these very seriously and works through them and talks about the limits and the impossibility of liberation in that liberal mode. Is the same kind of sto statement even conceivable for Dalits or blacks or women? Is the Dalit black women's question ever so precisely formulated. What would be the modes of apartness, to use that phrase, modes of apartness of Dalit's blacks women? Can the Dalit black women's question be posed as a question of emancipation assimilation by a dominant discourse that already claims to accommodate or include them? To say nothing of the question, can women, or for that matter Dalits or blacks, lay claim to the rights of separate nationhood which is the extreme case for difference, okay, or uh, uh, instancing of difference, cultural deviance. Or again, consider the proposition that nationalism necessarily unsettles long, uh, large numbers of people, rendering the minoritized populations potentially movable, and leading in many cases to the uprooting of entire populations, which we've seen happen in, in case after case in South, South Asia uh, on huge scale. It is clear that the minoritization of Dalits, blacks, uh, or women does not automatically render them movable. On the contrary, given the need for their labor, one might make the case that minorities, minoritization is a way of keeping them in their place, in both senses of that term. On the other hand, the uprooting of the population or uprooting of populations in the sense of settled social structures may be precisely what a subaltern minority would call for in such an instance, where it's actually not possible, very easily. Taking blacks or Dalits or women as the paradigm case of minority existence thus raises the issue of insider-outsider status in a rather different way from the case of the Jews or the Muslims. It necessitates pointed questions about disguised forms of internal colonialism and a more careful investigation of layers of settlement, privilege and power instituted over time. It may also tell us rather more about the broader history of minoritization, including the Jewish question of 19th century Europe. That's another story. The very notion of difference I'm suggesting suggests, or I've already said, suggests variety, indeterminacy, play, fluidity. In public life, the idea has for, for far too long now been appropriated to notions of cultural minority, following from cultural deviance in the context of claims to national homogeneity. Our task as investigators and critical commentators must be to examine the complicated history of this discourse of, this di of difference, its deployment and its effects. The multiplicity and ever-changing nature of what are described as minorities and minority positions and the numerous grids along which these classifications operate, grids that are by no means easily reduced to the organization and efficacy of the nation state idea. The next section I've called Subalternity and Difference. I suggested in my introduction to this book, Subaltern Citizens and Their Histories, that the foregrounding of differences of gender, sexuality, caste, race, etc., at the hands of the state and the dominant classes has long been a way of organizing and naturalizing subalternity. Thus, men are not different. It is women who are. Foreign colonizers are not different. It's the colonized, whose land we're in, who are different. Caste Hindus are not different in India. It is Muslims and tribals and Dalits who are. White Anglo-Saxon Protestant males are not different in the United States. At one time or another, everybody else is. White Australians are not different. 
Vietnamese boat people and Fijian migrants to Australia, and astonishingly, Australian aboriginals are. And that's from that earlier introduction. Difference becomes a mark of the subordinated or subalternized, measured as it is against the purported mainstream, the standard or the normal. What we are presented with are two terms in binary opposition. I'm qu quoting Elizabeth Gross here. Two terms in binary opposition hierarchically structured so that the dominant term is accorded both temporal and logical priority. It is in the attribution of difference then that the logic of dominance and subordination has commonly found expression. The pronouncement of difference becomes a way of legitimating and reinforcing existing relations of power. What the disadvantaged and the marginalized and subordinated women, blacks, Dalits, sexual minorities, conquered indigenous peoples, migrants, and unsettled populations have done in response is to deploy the very category of difference to demand a rearrangement, if not an overturning, of prevailing structures of power. For 200 years and more, the political exertions of the subaltern could be seen as a striving for recognition as equals. The history of these efforts appeared as a history of sameness and the right to sameness, one man, one vote, equal pay for equal work, the need to overturn inherited structures of oppression and discrimination, to capture state power, and so on. By the later 20th century, however, the battle has been self-consciously extended to encompass another demand, the demand for an acknowledgement and even privileging of certain kinds of difference. The basis of the new oppositional politics is not only a growing awareness the differences of gender, of communal practices and ways of being, even of incommensurable languages and beliefs, have provided the very ground for the diversity, densi density, and richness of human experience. The new stance follows from a recognition that difference and the very deployment of ideas of difference has been the ground for claims of identity, unitariness, priority, and privilege. Much feminist work has refused to accept any simple dichotomy that, uh, between claims to equality and claims to difference, and argued instead that equality requires the recognition and inclusion of difference. Such oppositional scholarship calls for a fundamental critique of the ways in which the idea of difference is deployed and of the operations of categorical difference, a category that of course marks out only some differences as being consequential. It is here in rethinking the diverse locations and uses of the proclamation of difference. That the example of the classically subaltern communities, Dalits, blacks, conquered indigenous populations, women, may have something unusual to tell us, given their uncertain and changing status as minorities, and as insiders, outsiders, who are essential to the continuance of a given social and economic order and yet have to be confined to a subordinate or marginalized place within it, precisely for the maintain maintenance of established structures and relations of power. The case I take up today is the Dalit struggle and Baba Sahib Ambedkar's articulation of it in 20th century India. I suggest that the example of this struggle enables us to reach beyond the confines of enlightenment discourse and facile propositions about deviance, assimilation, and tolerance even though Dalit thinkers and activists of the period remained constrained by the frame of the anticipated nation state and the language of majority and minority in the forging of an alternative politics. So um, the next section, which is a bit longer and which I'm sure you've been wanting me to come to as quickly as possible, <laughs> it relates to the Dalit struggle. Uh, and much of what I have to say here will be familiar to a lot of people in this audience. It's just that I need to rehearse some of this in order to make the argument about the kind of difference that I believe the Dalit struggle actually allows us to see, allows us to, to foreground and think about. In the decades preceding the end of British rule in India, as is well known, Dalit spokespersons laid claim to being, and I'm quoting these little phrases, a statutory minority, a separate element in the national life, a necessary party to political constitutional negotiations regarding the country's future, a separate community, even a nation like the Muslims and the Sikhs. There were inevitably many different grounds upon which Dalit leaders advanced the claim for the identifications uh, of the scheduled castes, as they were called after 1935, as a significant minority or community. Among them, the shared experience or history of labor and exploitation is one kind of ground. 
propositions about shared sentiment and suffering, very commonly articulated. And at the other extreme, the fact of statutory recognition. We are statutorily a minority. The particular difficulty faced by Ambedkar and others in making the claim that the Dalits were a minority, no different from Muslims, Sikhs, Christians, Anglo-Indians, and other such minorities, was plain. The untouchables, outcasts, depressed classes, Harijans, scheduled castes, whatever the appellation used for the assemblage, gained their distinctiveness, at least until they became a legally recognized minority, precisely from the fact of their untouchability. That is, the discrimination they had suffered at the hands of Hindu society. Gandhi was quick to point out the paradox inherent in the Dalit claim to existence as a separate minority. I'm quoting. This is at the Round Table Conference in London, 1931. Uh, we do not want on our, on our register and on our census untouchables classified as a separate class, Gandhi says. Sikhs may remain as such in perpetuity. So may Mohammedans. So may Europeans. Will untouchables remain untouchables in perpetuity? And this is a very clever lawyer uh, speaking. And, but, but he picks the paradox, which is of importance. In this respect, the Dalits were caught in an extraordinary bind, being defined by Hindu society and at the same time part and not part of it. Consider the ambivalence that appears in Ambedkar's presentation as law minister of the case for the reform of the uh, personal law of the Hindus, the Hindu Code Bill. At one stage in the debate on the Hindu Code Bill, he referred to the Hindu Shastras as your Shastras. To a member's interjection, your Shastras? He responded by saying, yes, because I belong to the other caste. And a little later, I am an unusual member of the Hindu community. This is within the same debate. At another point in the same debate, he spoke of, I'm quoting, our ancient ideals, which are to my judgment most archaic and impossible for anybody to practice. So there's this ambivalent, difficult position that he has to inhabit and work with in order to, to convert the opponent as much as anything else. There was clearly no easy escape from the aggrandizing character of Hinduism, even for a leader who had declared 15 years earlier, I had the misfortune of being born with the stigma of being an, un an untouchable. It is not my fault, but I will not die a Hindu, for this is in my power. It is in this context that Ambedkar opens up the question of the meaning of so-called Hindu society or community with a radical reinterpretation of the, of the Indian past and therefore of the needs of the Indian future. Ambedkar's recasting of Indian history as an extended and unfinished uh, struggle between Brahmanism and Buddhism was a move of far-reaching implication. He was able to propose it, I submit, precisely because he spoke for a constituency very different from that claimed by the leaders of other pre-existing, that is to say, on the face of it, already given and recognized religious or racial minorities, or, or majorities for that matter. Whereas the Congress's distribution of the divide between the nation, peoples, friends and enemies was into something called India and its development on the one side, and anyone who would partition the country or detract from its development on the other, and the best-known minority version of the recent history and current predicament of the subcontinent was the Muslim League's proposal, proposal of a federation of communities threatened by an arrogant and unduly privileged majority. Ambedkar went rather further in his re-examination of how these putative communities and their claims on the land and the people came to be. India is the land which is, I'm quoting, India is the land which has experienced class consciousness, class struggle in its most extreme form, he wrote the land where there has been fought a class war between Brahmins and Kshatriyas, which lasted for several generations and which, fought, which was fought so hard and with such virulence that it turned out to be a war of extermination. End of quote. Uh, another quote. The history of India be before the Muslim invasions is the history of a mortal conflict between Brahmanism and Buddhism. You know all of this, but it's, it's a very important move, and, uh, uh, which I'm going to uh, say something about. He, he sp spells out the, the proposition about what this history has been about and what the different ideals have been. Inequality was the official doctrine of Brahmanism. Buddhism opposed it root and branch. And then he spells out the range of issues that we've been talking about this morning uh, to a large extent and this afternoon. Um, the Shudra could never aspire to be, be a Brahman in the Ved Vedic regime, but he could become a bhikshu or a Buddhist men mendicant, and occupied the same status and dignity as did the Brahman. Similar change is noticeable in the case of women, 
Under the Buddhist regime, she became a free person. She could acquire property, she could acquire learning, and what was unique, she could become a member of the Buddhist order of nuns and reach the same status and dignity as, as a Brahman. How very galling this must have been to the Brahmins and so on and so forth. And, you know, it talks about the fallout, which is really very bloody and, uh, and heinous in, in some ways. India's untouchable communities were originally Buddhist, Ambedkar argued in, in his 1948 book uh, uh, called The Untouchables. They were thrust into the demeaning position of untouchability when they clung to Buddhism in the midst of a warrior and court-inspired resurgence of Brahmanical Hinduism. Broken men who declined with Buddhism, he says. And, I'm quoting, we can say with, con with some confidence that untouchability was born sometime about 400 AD. It is born out of the struggle for supremacy between Buddhism and Brahmanism, which has so completely molded the history of India end of the quotes that you know very, very well from, from Baba Sahib's uh, writings. I want to say something about this claim on the past and what it leads Ambedkar to, what arguments it opens up. The claim on a Buddhist past and the 1956 conversion to Buddhism was not primarily aimed, I'm, uh, I, I want to suggest, at providing memory to a memoryless people, uh, to use Dr. Nagaraj's um, evocative phrase. Although that was certainly part of the point and part of the reason for the presentation of Indian history as the history of struggle between Brahmanism and Buddhism. Rather, as Ambedkar's restatement of Buddhism showed very clearly, this was a conversion for the future. In Ambedkar's view, uh, as uh, Christopher Queen puts it, Buddhism, is Christopher Queen here? Okay. <laughs> I knew I was going to quote people who have done Trump, but uh, it's very nice to see you here. Uh, so, as Chris has said, Buddhism, in Ambedkar's view, was the only viable religion, not only for the untouch untouchables of India, but for, for the modern world at large. This regenerated Buddhism was to provide a religion or an ethic for our times. And remember that Ambedkar was uh, ambivalent about his use of the term religion or ethic. He was a little bit uncertain how he should describe this religion of our times a religion of humanity or an ethic for humanity, of liberty, equality and fraternity, but especially of equality between men and women, upper caste and lower caste, class and class, of reason and of progress, with compassion and understanding and a minimum of violence, all of that. Investigators in the 1960s and the 1980s, uh, many of them from, from this country, found that the most common argument given by Dalit converts in favor of the Buddhist Dhamma was an argument about universal human dignity, the opportunity to live like a man, uh, the restoration of self-respect, confidence, and an end to feelings of inferiority, all of which uh, followed from the rejection of Hinduism and its caste hierarchy. With conversion, many of them said, we became human beings. Gautam's Dhamma is like no other, as an anonymous Dalit woman's song has it, a man finds humanity there. I want to cite just one recollection of a conversion ceremony in uh, a small, uh, in a remote area in, in the Konkan, uh, which appears in uh, Urmila uh, Pawar's autobiography, Ayadan, uh, as an example of what conversion appears to have meant to people in places quite far and wide. Um, this was a conversion that took place uh, several months after uh, Ambedkar's death, in, uh, which occurred, of course, as you know, in December 56. And Pawar writes very interestingly about those, the, the period following the death of Baba Zahib, uh, Ambedkar uh, and the discussions in the village. Actually, she says, none of us understood very well what exactly conversion meant. Nor did we know much about this man, Ambedkar, who had advised us to convert. Yet the day of his passing came to be, and I'm quoting, indelibly printed in her memory. So this is uh, um, Maya Pandit's translation. It's a very beautiful translation. Pavar was only 12 at the time, and she returned from school to discover family el elders and neighbors weeping. One of them who worked in another town decided to take the overnight train to Mumbai to catch a last glimpse of Baba Sahib's body. The atmosphere of mourning, she recalls, lasted for several months, while information about Ambedkar's death, his struggles, and his wishes trickled in through Dalit's working in various places outside the village. Sometime during this period, preparations for dharmantar, for conversion, began. The conversion itself was a dramatic moment. Something changed, Babar recalls, 
belief in evil spirits, possession, and incidents of actual experiences of ghosts came to an abrupt end after conversion. And people like Urmila's mother, and she recalls this, the struggle of her mother with, with great, uh, almost with anguish, but, but, but in some detail, uh, very interestingly. People like Urmila's mother who had strongly believed in all of those things, you know, ghosts and their appearance and uh, evil spirits and possession, uh, seemed to take on a new life. The Dharmantar ceremony took place in the grounds of Gogate College in Ratnagiri, the nearest large town. Urmila and her siblings went there with the mother and other people of the village. People poured in from everywhere, she writes. In the midst of the various announcements, the mantra of Buddham Sharanam Gachami floated down to us and we joined our voices with the, with the chanting crowd. After the ceremony, the villagers were told to discard the gods they worshipped and throw the idols into the water. Urmila Pawar says that she half expected her mother would refuse, given that theirs was a priest's family and that many of the images were actually rather valuable. They, they, had, they were expensive. Instead of that, her mother picked up some idols and threw them into the water herself. The children also joined the early morning procession that took the idols to be thrown into the river. A Dalit elder placed a small statue of the Buddha and a photograph of Ambedkar in Urmila's mother's prayer room. People went from house to house every evening venerating the Buddha, recalls uh, Pawar. And I'm quoting, their faces glowed. You would think there was no longer any need to ask for happiness as it had automatically come to us. Other recollections of Dalit conversion to Buddhism in different villages and towns following Ambedkar's embracing of the Dhamma in 1956 provide a similar sense of anticipation and of a political difference already at hand. I think this is important. The political difference, the future, is here. In account after account, conversion appears as a magical time. The Diksha ceremony was completed in a joyful atmosphere, uh, writes Shantabai Krishna, Krishnaji Kamle of the ceremony in her husband's village of Karga, Kargani uh, in 1957 again. The struggle yielded us three jewels, writes baby Kamle, humanity, education, and the religion of the Buddha. The flame of Bhim started burning in our hearts. We began to walk and talk. We became conscious that we too are human beings. A moment suffused with ideas of liberation, rebirth, and purity. References to spotless white recur in Dalit accounts of the Ambedkarite movement in the 1940s and 50s. And this, when I first heard of it, was really quite striking to me. The number of people who talked about how their parents insisted they dress in spotless white. We are told that the cloth stores in Nagpur ran out of white saris at the 1956 in initiation uh, of Ambedkar and his half million followers and that the women among the initiates actually wore white men's dhotis. Right. The spotless white is associated with the promise of new, fuller lives and the purest and most inspiring of ideals embodied in the Buddha and Baba Sahib Ambedkar. For all that, and again, Christopher Quinn and others have written about this, Baba Sahib Ambedkar, of course, as we all know, is represented in the garb of a middle-class intellectual much of the time. But nonetheless, the pure white is associated with these lives. How did millions of illiterate people follow one man? Baby Kamle asks about Ambedkar, though her question and her answer could apply equally to the Buddha. And this is her answer. He was a man who believed in himself. He had courage and fortitude. He never changed his positions, nor did he ever compromise his principles for selfish gain. Money, prosperity, fame, nothing could tempt him. His heart was soft and tender, full of love for the downtrodden. His character was spotlessly clean, without any blemish. This was the moment of conversion, I'm, I'm suggesting to you. This is the, the construction of it. I want to conclude with a few thoughts about what this tells us about the idea of difference. The long, out, uh, long drawn out event of the Dalit conversion to Buddhism and Ambedkar's reflections on that event should help to clarify something about the manner of the establishment of political, or for that matter, religious community. And it is a good point at which to return to the question I began with of the making of community and difference. <laughs>
Increasingly from the 1930s, Ambedkar and some other Dalit leaders had begun to advocate the renouncing of Hinduism as a means of solving what was called the problem of the untouchables. Gandhi, dedicated in his own way to the abolition of untouchability, deferred. What was needed, he argued, was the reform of Hinduism, or what he called self-purification. Conversion was not the answer. One cannot change one's religion as if it were a house or a cloak, he wrote. For Gandhi, the threat, threat of Dalit conversion flowed from a political rather than a religious impulse. Ambedkar's rejoinder to this is important for my purposes. Apart from making a pointed comment on precisely the political character of much of the religious history of the world and of much that counted as conversion, he met Gandhi's house and cloak metaphor with an equally polemical but telling response. Religion today was like a piece of ancestral property, he said. A piece of ancestral property passed on from parent to child and accepted unthinkingly. What genuineness is there in such religious belief? Quoting. The conversion of the untouchables, if it did take place, he wrote, and this is 1936 after a conference in Bombay, uh, the conference which considered the question of conversion possible. The conversion of the un untouchables, if it did take place, would take place after full deliberation of the value of religion and the virtue of different religions. It would be the first case in history of genuine conversion. The Dalit leader here points to the long process of thinking and deliberation, both social and individual, that must accompany the Dalit conversion. This is the future. It is the process that counts, he might have added. In other words, Ambedkar's first case of genuine conversion might also be seen as the, a first step in the making of a difference, which would also be a political difference, whatever else it was. A word here about the question of culture and cultural difference in this moment of conversion or resistance. Scholarship on resistance literature, as it has been called, has stressed the importance of the rhetoric of refusal that is found in much oppositional writing. A refusal, this is Rigoberta Menchu, Toni Morrison, all sorts of resistance literature which has taken on this, this kind of uh, interesting investigation of the rhetoric of refusal. A refusal that marks the reader's anomalous position and signals the distance of the reader from the narrator. It's a distance that we're not going to be able to bridge and we do not want to bridge for a whole variety of reasons. I am suggesting that this is a dif distance difference that is also to be found in Dalit self-assertion, but not, I submit, as the difference of pure culture. In the case of the Dalits, as in that of many other subalternized minorities, the internally colonized, we might call them, who do not inhabit a geopolitical sp space that provides easy ground for a politics of separation or of independent nationhood, and I would include blacks and women here, as I said earlier. It has never been a straightforward task to mark out a sequestered domain of an autonomous culture. The claim of a unified and alternative culture and tradition is established here, if it is established, only through long and hard struggle. And recall again the women's movement, which has lived with this for ever so long, and for, forever, in a sense, for and against an argument about a culture of women, womankind. You, you can't resolve that one, and in some senses one should not resolve that one, would, would be, would be the, uh, the politics of that position, I think. It is this alternative culture and tradition, if it is established, I'm suggesting, after long and hard struggle, it is more deliberately forged and far more openly contested than the cultural claims of more privileged groups with more secure cultural institutions and funding, uh, and, and greater access to political power. And the politics that accompany the construction of this alternative culture and tradition are never quite so easily wished away. The resistance refusal found in the Dalit movement and Dalit history then is not that of an already available culture or identity, the culture or identity of Dalits or ex-untouchables or however we might describe the group. Uh, the facet of resistance, the foreign accent or unassimilable distance that uh, the uh, resistance literature people are talking about is not the resistance of another culture. It is instead the resistance of a different politics. 
uh, and the call for a differently imagined future. This is not a politics that flows from cultural difference, somehow already constituted, but rather a culture that flows from political difference and an alternative political perspective. And I think it's important to, to insist upon this and underline it. In a many-sided engagement with the history of subalternity and difference in the subcontinent, what Dr. Ambedkar analyzed, it seems to me, analyzes in, in many, many different ways, many different times, is the question of labor and exploitation in production, the oppressions of caste quite outside, quite aside from the matter of economic production and distribution, the subordination and confinement of women, the challenges and containment of different religious as well as political ideals and practices. His work underlies, uh, underlines the process of the creation of these confinements and oppressions, these uh, identifications and these ideals. This is the history and the politics of a becoming and of political cultural communities yet to be. Not, as it appears in Gandhi's exchanges with Ambedkar at this point, of already established, stable, and relatively immutable identities and commitments. So I want to, I'll conclude simply by returning to Baby Kamle's comment. This, I quote it to you, the struggle yielded us three jewels, humanity, education, and the religion of the Buddha. The flame of Bhim started burning in our hearts. We began to walk and talk. We became conscious that we are human beings. Yielded us three jewels. Yielded is an important word. And it applies to the us in this statement the Dalits, as well as to humanity, education, and religion. We began to walk and talk. We became conscious. The struggle yielded up the Dalit community, a Dalit politics, and the outlines of a Dalit future, as other struggles and other elements and other arrangements of power will yield up other communities, fresh alliances and possibilities, and perhaps still undreamt of futures. Thank you. Can you, we have some questions. Fifteen minutes, Shivakami. Just let me give you the mic. In the course of your presentation, you mentioned that uh, how clever of Gandhi, uh, it's trivial though, uh, regarding the minority status for Dalits. The Sikhs and uh, Muslims will remain as Sikhs and Muslims, whereas the untouchables will not remain as untouchables. And when you said clever, I thought it's very loaded. And um, maybe you wanted to imply that as long as there is indignified seclusion, that is the Dalits, and dignified seclusion that the Brahmins, when they coexist, and uh, I think untouchability in spirit and thing will continue, that which Gandhi did not realize. That's what you wanted to imply? Go on to the question. Um, yeah, because see, on the one hand, you have dignified seclusion that the Brahmins, they didn't want others to touch them because it will be, they will be, uh, you know, polluted. On the other side, they didn't want others to interact with the Dalits because they are impure. So the pure and impure, as long as they remain in opposite ends, the untouchability in spirit and, you know, practice will continue. That's what I thought you wanted to imply and that's what the statement clever, you know, was attributed to Gandhi, I thought. But I'll share it with you. Do you want me to um, would you like to respond or do you want me to take a few more questions? I, I'm happy to respond. I, um, I, I like the way you put that. I mean, and, I, and I would send, I would agree with exactly what you're saying. Um, but I think Gandhi was making a much more, what should we say, mundane point that there is a group that is called untouchables. There is a practice called untouchability. He's, he's much more, what should we say, uh, literal about the existence of these things. I don't think he's thinking particularly of a future 
and of other ways, subtle ways in which this might persist and spirit will, would survive. He is, he is simply, that's why I said it was a clever argument, he's simply saying that this category and these practices, they should not stay forever, right? Surely you don't want that. that, that that's the argument that he's making. I think you helped me clarify something I've been wondering about a long time. My name is Gary Tartikoff. Uh, how much of our discussion, and it's big discussion my whole lifetime, of difference, how much of the discussion of difference in this context of blacks and Dalits is an avoidance of the discussion of exploitation? Right? It's easier to talk about color than it is exploitation, or it's easier to talk about pollution than it is the exploitation of those who are then called polluted. Well, Gary, I mean, I think that your question answers it. And basically, one requires that kind of investigation continuously. M my concern is that the one masquerades as the other repeatedly. And that's, that's the escape from the task of the, the uh, critic and the investigator, which must be to find how each one comes into place, each one of those, how they come into place. Because both exist, very much so. But if, if you can talk about exploitation in one uh, seminar and about color in another seminar, you're safe, you're, you're fine. You can talk about both of them, many, many people do, and say it's exactly the same thing, right? It's exactly the same thing, and you've, you've evaded the task once again. Say they're, they're really different. Uh, discrimination is mean and unpleasant and sometimes against the law, but exploitation violates what we say is the equality we should all have. Exploitation is an absolute denial of democracy. Yeah. And is mean and exploitative and, mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes against the law. Hi. <laughs> Uh, my question, I don't know how, how much is it uh, directly relevant to what you presented, but I still would be would great if you can just, uh, I'm struggling with that question, so can if you can help name? me with that. So uh, the linkages, I find... Your name? Uh, Bhavani. Uh, the linkages, I think, which I can make from your presentation and the first session which we had uh, is, and uh, you make a line that the little leader claims are based on like share, uh, shared experience of his, uh, uh, exploitation, their labor, and all, all these things. So I just want to know how does the recent historical and historical anthropological research, which argues that caste is a, either a colonial construction or colonial rigidification, uh, affects uh, the memory of the memoryless people, especially vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, just quickly I'll do this, vis-a-vis -vis reservation debate, because reservation does, uh, affirmative action doesn't just remain, uh, it, it transforms from a right to a charity because the history of the people have been history of oppression, oppression as a difference uh, has been cut short by arguing that colonial, it, it, let's, let's blame the British for that. So I just, I, if, I'm struggling with this question because I, I hear this in the discourse both in GNU, in IIT, and when I do a field work in the villages in Rajasthan. So it has, like the capillary reaction has taken, that the, let's not, the, the Brahmins, the British becomes the Brahmins. So if you can just help me clarify. Bhavani, that's so large. I, you, don't, you don't really expect an answer to that. You'll have to do the research. I, I'll just say very quickly that I don't think anyone is saying the British manufactured caste, it didn't exist, you know, that there was no such thing. Colonial construction means uh, some very interesting things about the way in which caste gets molded. And I don't think, I've not heard very many people say that reservations or affirmative action is a bad thing in itself. I mean, I think there's a, there's a lot of uh, question uh, about how, how one might most effectively work with that instrument that's available, with, with things that have already been given to us. But all, all of the questions you're asking are going to remain in place. There's, uh, there's no short answer to them from me or from you, I suspect. Uh, myself, Ramaya. Uh, with all this uh, modern education philosophy, do you ever think that even in another 50 years, uh, the Hindus will learn to respect the other Hindus as equals, yeah. What's your answer? 
Kian, I'm going to take a couple more questions for you and gather a few questions and then you can answer. Yeah, thanks for giving. Um, this is Sakya Mohan. Um, you just in the beginning, in the first part of your lecture, you know, it's really uh, interesting to me, but I have a little question about it. The second part is really fantastic. The first part, you know, you mentioned about subaltern isolation, subalterns, like that. Do you try to, you know, uh, you know, put, you know, Dalits in the lineup of uh, with, uh, general women or anything like, uh, because Ranajit Kuga included Dalits only in the ninth volume. Until then, Dalits were not subalterns. You know, it's really a question, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, this, this, the whole uh, lecture, you know, you have given, it's, it's really getting uh, diverted because I'm, I, I think that I, uh, I learned that you try to put the Dalits in subaltern position because subaltern position is a middle position. So Dalits are in the last position are out of the caste system. Thank you. I'm sorry, it takes me a little time to walk across. Short question. Uh, my name is Chinnaya. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, again, I really like the way in which you try to draw this uh, larger perspective in terms of uh, both historically and also in terms of connecting caste and race and uh, to pick up the thread from what Pratap Manumeta left in the morning about this lack of ethical engagement in Dalit politics especially in contemporary India where basically the o either OBC politics or Dalit politics one of the important problem is this not having ethical engagement and he also mentioned another interesting thing is that the actual ethical engagement in Indian history happened from 19... 20s to 1950s, which means especially when Gandhi and Ambedkar are together and trying to resolve this whole issue of untouchability. So in this, oh sorry, uh, to add to what actually, so to pick up two things, one thing about uh, Gandhi, Ambedkar and also you also talked about uh, D.R. Nagaraj. It's very interesting in the sense, don't you think that there is very problem, both Gandhi, Ambed, Gandhi and Ambedkar realized that there are problems with liberal democracy which cannot resolve this whole question of caste, in which both, you know, uh, for Gandhi, it's a torturous process of self-cleansing self which becomes a means to end the untouchability. For Ambedkar, what happens at the end of his life, one of the things about coming into religion as an important part of emancipation project. I think, don't you think we, the, this issue of race and caste needs to be seen beyond race? liberal democracy where basically religion becomes a very important aspect. Even Malcolm X in the end he sees Islam as important a way of emancipation. Thank you. Gyan, do you want to answer those and we'll take a few more and then invite people to the reception? Sure. Um, I'm not sure Ramaya really wants an answer to the question. Uh, <laughs> will, will Hindus change in the next 50 years? Let's hope so. <laughs> Sorry? Astrology. Right. Um, to R.K. Mohan's question, um, I, you know, I, I don't know about subalterns being a mid-position and the critique of subaltern studies in, uh, in its earlier incarnations is well taken. There's no problem. There were no women there. There were all sorts of things that were really wrong with subaltern studies and all sorts of things that might remain wrong. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing subaltern studies here. I was investigating the question of difference. And in the question of difference, I, I put it to you, I put it in this, in this particular argument, that it's the culturally deviant that becomes the paradigmatic case. And I'm simply putting forward an argument about how groups that do come to be seen as minorities, as marginalized, as people that do need state intervention, protection, affirmative action, all sorts of things, okay? If these alternative groups, like Dalits, blacks, or women, and these are very, very different groups, we get very different histories if you've um, pursued each one through. But if one took those sorts of examples as the paradigmatic case of difference, what results do we come up with? And I think we come up with very different results. That's the basic proposition. 
I, I mean, you want to include Dalits among subalterns or you don't? You, you want to use the term subaltern or not? That's, that's entirely you know, in the hands of the scholar and the political commentator. There's, there's no reason to use that term specially. So just a, a shorthand which works for certain kinds of relationships. That's, a, that's all I was saying. Um, and Chinaya, the, I think your, the question, the short question is um, beyond the liberal democratic possibilities and, and um, um, alternatives, propositions, isn't there need for looking at something like religion? And the answer is, well, clearly the liberal democratic uh, schemes are insufficient. They're inadequate for all sorts of reasons, and we can see that. That's why the Jew cannot be liberated as Jew. The Muslim cannot be liberated as Muslim, cannot remain Muslim and be liberated. Can women remain women and be liberated? You know, there's going to be something very interesting in, in, in articulating and working through this question. So religion or uh, moves out of mainstream claims to national culture. Yeah? Absolutely vital to, to, the, to this task. But I want to ask a question too, and I ask it in, uh, out of uh, Dr. Ambedkar's work here. How do we read this religion? How do we read this alternative culture? And the proposition I'm making is that this is a culture of an alternative politics, and that that is what we must foreground to a very large extent. I don't see that as a liberal alternative. A couple more questions, Ram. Uh, thank you again, uh, uh, Ram Narayan Rawat from University of Pennsylvania. Uh, again, uh, it was a great talk, and I, I'm also thinking along these, some of these issues. Um, I'm interested, you said, uh, to radicalize the character of subalternity or subaltern, and I'm wondering what is it in the contemporary world that makes this kind of uh, discussion possible, that when you think of subaltern, uh, you, you're not talking about black, Dalit, and women, I mean, what is it that made this possible? Uh, is it our arrival in the U.S.? I mean, to crudely put, and what was it that did make it possible in India? Uh, these kind of discussions, uh, or uh, to put it in another way, was it the collapse of uh, Marxism in many ways that made this discussion possible? Collapse of Marxism in an intellectual way, and the way in which the Balkan studies has moved beyond this. Uh, you know, so does that, that, does that make sense? <laughs> uh, to the extent that it does, uh, I'll split that into, into two parts, Ram. I mean, this, these conversations are taking place in India. Uh, you don't have to come to the United States to, to begin these conversations. There's no question of that. So I do not think you, that, you know, your move to Pennsylvania is, is, the, is the reason that you would begin to think about these questions. The collapse of Marxism has a lot to do with rethinking the revolutionary subject of the future. There's no doubt about it. And subaltern studies was partly uh, a response to that. Uh, the relationships between very different kinds. The question of difference was not central to classical Marxism. It's as, it's as simple as that. Feminism brings it forward, makes it an absolute central question of modern politics, right? And we all, everyone in the later 20th century has to negotiate the question of difference along with the question of dominance and subordination seen in classically Marxist terms. Well, it's 6.45. It's 5.45, and I have wine. I hope that is good. I have wine. I have hors d'oeuvres, seltzer, orange juice, sparkling cider. So please join me in thanking Gyan Pandey for a wonderful plenary address. Join us.